القدس تنادينا القدس تنادينا القدس تنادينا القدس تنادي القدس تنادي القدس تنادينا الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبع فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم سورة النحل of the Quran and we sent down the book on the O Muhammad عليه الصلاة والسلام that this book might explain all things and therefore that this book might explain that strangest of all events to occur in the religious history of mankind. When Banu Israel, who had been expelled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, expelled from the Holy Land, and then banned from returning to reclaim it, 2,000 years later, strangely, mysteriously, mystifyingly, Banu Israel return to the Holy Land and reclaim it as their own. This Quran and only this Quran will explain that event. And this Quran will explain that equally strange event. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the state of Israel. And then for 2,000 years, it never existed. And then strangely, bafflingly, mysteriously, mystifyingly, a state of Israel is restored in the Holy Land. This Quran will explain it. And in this Quran, there is guidance. How to respond to that strange dunya in that age, which will witness the return of the Jews to the Holy Land to reclaim it, and witness the restoration of the state of Israel in the Holy Land. How do we live in that dunya? How do we respond to its awesome challenges? This Quran will explain it. That explanation and that guidance have come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as an act of rahmah, kindness, raindrops. And for those who have the good sense and the wisdom to go to the book of Allah and search in it. Search in it. If you are 17 years of age tonight, or 18, or 19, or 20, or 21, or 22, this lecture is for you tonight. Yes, it's for you. The others can listen, of course. <laughs> but this lecture is for you. If you go to the Quran and search with tears in your eyes and tears in your heart, Search, and when Allah blesses you with that understanding of that explanation and that guidance, you accept it, and you embrace it, and you apply it regardless of the price that you may have to pay, my son. Bushra lahum, good news, glad tidings for you. You will understand what others cannot, and you will succeed when others will not. We praise Allah and we glorify Him this night. 
and we beseech him most humbly for his guidance and for his blessings and for his protection and we need that protection more and more every day that passes by as we attempt to address the subject Jerusalem in the Quran and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam I have good news for Campbelltown or is it Mintu, Mintu Masjid? Sawasa and that is that since last I was here Alhamdulillah I completed my book entitled Jerusalem in the Quran it has been published we had the launching function for this book in uh, the Subang Jaya Masjid in Kuala Lumpur about two or three weeks ago and the guest speaker on that occasion for the launching of my book was Dr. Malik Badri and he's here he's here in Australia at the same time that I'm here may Allah bless him my elder brother I call him my teacher when you get a chance to go and listen to him do please go and do that and Alhamdulillah the book has arrived in Australia and I'm told they got it out of the docks this afternoon so Mintu Masjid you're the first to be able to see that book Jerusalem in the Quran it is downstairs so you have that distinction in Australia the Imam recited بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير Glory be to him who took his servant by night from this sacred masjid built by Ibrahim alayhi salam on the foundations of the spot where Adam alayhi salam had worshipped. This masjid was in the Torah. They took it out. Took him by night from this masjid on a miraculous journey to that masjid, that distant one bit by Suleiman alayhi salam, alathi barakna hawla, which was located in a land which we had blessed. Don't use the word precincts. <laughs> Don't use the word surroundings. <laughs> because it's the whole land which has been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was located in the Holy Land. The Holy Land appears in the Quran for the first time in Surah Al Anbiya. When you remember, he was a young man, just a young man. And he went and he broke up the idols. Today, the idols are ruling the world. The idols are sitting in the Security Council of the UN. <laughs> And he went and he broke up the idols. And they decided to punish him. And they threw him into the fire. Allah is pleased when a young man stands up firmly for Allah. When you are old and your beard is white, it's not the same thing anymore. Allah is pleased when a young man stands up courageously, courageously for the truth. And so Allah spoke to the fire. Fire always burns, but this time, no. Allah ordered the fire, be cool for Ibrahim and keep him safe. Allah can intervene at any time he wants to protect whomsoever he wants. Because he is fa'alul lima yurid. He can do whatever he wants to do. And he says, It is obligatory upon us to do that. Ibrahim Islam can no longer live in Babylon. Today it's called Iraq. 
And so he's given orders to make hijrah. وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ وَلُوطًا إِلَى الْأَرْضِ الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا لِلْعَالَمِينَ And we took him and his nephew Lut alayhi salam to a land in which we had placed blessings for all of mankind. Mark the words, for all of mankind. But when he reached in that holy land, he is tested. Take the mother and take the baby. Take them out there in the desert and leave them there. No food, no water, no shelter, no security. What is the role of reason in religion? Uncle Sam says, you know Uncle Sam, ruling the world, that religion must conform to reason. That reason must sit in judgment over religion. <coughs> And if reason were to sit in judgment over this, it doesn't make sense. Take the mother and take the baby, take them out there in the desert and leave them there. No food, no water, no shelter, no security. Had it been Iblis, he would have taken off his hat. He would have scratched his head. He said, no, this is irrational. Even though it's the command of the Lord, I'm not going to do it. Didn't he do that? When ordered to bow down, he said, no. Why should I do that? It's irrational. It's illogical. You created me from fire. You created him from clay. You don't have to be a, a PhD from University of New South Wales to know that fire is superior to clay. It follows logically therefrom. I am superior to him. I'm not bowing down. Because reason, reason must sit in judgment over religion. And religion must conform to the requirements of reason. And so the great logician named Iblis, he disobeyed Allah. But not Ibrahim alayhi salam. And this is the first teach, the first lesson that my teacher of blessed memory taught me. The very first lesson I received as a student of the Alima Institute of Islamic Studies was this lesson. He taught us. Of course, I was a young man at that time. He said, when once you know it is the word of Allah, whether you understand it or you don't, whether you are comfortable with it or not, you must submit to it. That is Islam. That's the first lesson I got. And so Ibrahim alayhi salam left them there. Rabbana inni askantu min zurriyati biwadin ghayri zi zara inda baytika al muharram. Oh my Lord, I've left them there. In that barren valley where nothing grows, I've left them there. You asked me to do it. I've done it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders him, sacrifice your son. What? I didn't hear that. Sacrifice your son. Oh no. Religion must conform to reason. And this is irrational, argues of course Iblis, scratching his head. Religion must conform to reason. And this is irrational. That religion should ask of me to sacrifice my son. I ain't going to do it. That's the way of Iblis. And that's the way of those who come out of the universities established by Iblis. And so they'll change the religion to make it conform with the requirements of the modern age. They will subject the verses of the Quran to what they call a progressive interpretation. So that it can conform with the requirements of the modern, excuse me, godless age. But not Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ya bunayya, inni ara fil manami anni azbahuk. فَانْزُرْ مَاذَا تَرَى 
Son, I've been ordered to sacrifice you by Allah. Son, what is your response? I'm ready, are you? I'm ready, are you? A worthy son of a worthy father. And he says, Ya Abati Fa'al Ma Tu'mar. Oh my father, go ahead. Do what you've been ordered to do. I'm also ready. Satajiduni. And then he uses the word that the godless world never uses. Satajiduni. Insha'Allah min sabirin You never hear that from their lips. It is very easy to recognize the godless world. Because when it walks around, it'll never see, never see, never see, insha'Allah. Huh? And so Ibrahim alayhi salam has passed every test. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses him. Inni ja'iluka linnasi imama. I hereby appoint you as the Imam of all of mankind, including George Bush. <laughs> I hereby appoint you the Imam of all of mankind. If he is the Imam of all of mankind, and you are engaged in that, stu that stuff called interfaith, you've heard about it? Interfaith? Well, then listen to me. If he is the Imam of all of mankind, it follows that his religion is the religion of all of mankind. Anyone disagrees? No? If his religion is the religion of all of mankind, it follows that there is only one true religion, it is his religion. Anyone disagrees? <coughs> there is only one true religion. All others are false. Only one true religion. Is that chauvinism? Or is that truth? The Quran addresses Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam and says to him, Thumma awhayna ilayk. And then we reveal to thee, O Muhammad alayhi salatu wa sallam, an ittabi' millata Ibrahim hanifa. That you also, you must follow the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And this is the Holy Land. And he is the Imam of all mankind. And there is only one true religion. It is his religion. Now we leave the Holy Land for a while. And we go to Banu Israel. Who lived from the seed of Ibrahim alayhi salam in the Holy Land until Yusuf alayhi salam is taken out of the well by the travelers. Are you shaking your heads? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Taken out of the well and taken to Egypt and sold. Oh no, not to Egypt, sorry. Taken to Misr. Because they're not the same, you know. Even Egyptians don't know that. <laughs> taken to Misr and sold in slavery in Misr. And then he becomes the prime minister. Hmm? And then his family come to live with him. So Banu Israel are now in Misr, which is the eastern delta. But then some things occur which eventually led to their being enslaved in Egypt. And for that, you're going to have to invite me to come and lecture on the subject of Ashura in the Quran. <laughs> Ashura in the Quran. To know why were Banu Israel enslaved in Egypt. We don't have the time to take that up. And then Allah raised Musa alayhi salam. And Musa alayhi salam took them over into freedom across the sea. وَإِذْ فَرَقْنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرِ فَأَنْجَيْنَاكُمْ وَأَغْرَقْنَا آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْزُرُونَ hmm? So they crossed the Red Sea. And now they are in Sinai. Sinai, not the hospital in Manhattan. The desert. And then Musa al Islam went up the mountain, came back down with the Torah, the Ten Commandments, 
stone tablets. Hmm? And then Musa alayhi salam addresses Banu Israel, and this is in Surah Al-Ma'idah. I suggest you get the tape recording. No, no, you have the book now. And every, every single ayah of the Quran I quote, you go and find it in the Quran and study it. Hmm? Musa alayhi salam says, A'udhu billahi min shaytanir rajeem. He says, Ya qawmi dkhulul arda al-muqaddasata allati kataba Allahu lakum ila akhir al-ayah. Oh my people, come on, let us enter, fight and take control of the holy land which Allah gave to you. Did you hear that? The Quran declares that Allah gave the land to the Jews or to Banu Israel. Well, how come we don't hear the state of Israel talking about that? How come the New York Times doesn't publish that as a headline? Why are they so afraid of the Quran? And why don't you use the Quran to wage the terrific battle against them? Wajahidhum bihi jihadan kabira, says Allah. Wage a mighty struggle against them using the Quran. That's what He has ordered us to do. The reason why they will not quote the Quran is because they don't want the attention of mankind to be directed towards the Qur'an because the Qur'an will expose their fraud. Yes, Allah gave the land to them. But the grant of the land was not unconditional. It was conditional. What were the conditions? وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرِسُهَا عِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ Which أرض? الأرض المقدسة That in order to inherit the Holy Land you must conform with two requirements. Number one you must be a servant of Allah and a servant of Allah will follow the Imam appointed by Allah and would follow the religion of that Imam. So you must follow the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And condition number two, you have to be righteous in your conduct. When Musa alayhi salam ordered them to come on and let's fight, when they learned that there were powerful people living in the land, you know the story of Goliath, hmm? they said, no, we're not going. We're not going. You and your Lord, both of you go and fight. We go stay right here. For us, it's something difficult. Difficult to stomach. When the Lord has just performed this miracle before your very eyes. He parted the sea for you and saved you and destroyed Firaun and his army before your very eyes. And when that Nabi who led you to freedom is still there in your midst and that you should respond with such insolence, it is something beyond comprehension. So maybe now we can begin to understand the nature of the problem that we are dealing with in the world today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who had given the holy dan to them now puts a bar. He bans them from entering into the holy land for how long? How long? How long? Twelve years? Forty years. Good. Do you don't mind my questioning you? You don't fall asleep. Forty years. So here is evidence, plain as daylight for every Jew to understand and accept that although the land was given to him, he is now debarred from entering. Why? There is only one answer to that question. He has violated the conditions of inheritance. 
But someone changed the word of Allah. And every time you change the word of Allah, you plant an evil seed. And one day, one day, it's going to come back at you. It will grow into an evil tree. And ain't nobody can cut it down. They changed the word of Allah. You will find this in my book, Jerusalem in the Quran. You'll also find it in my previous book, The Religion of Abraham and the State of Israel, a view from the Quran. What did they do? They wrote into the Torah with their own hands. What did they write? It is not because of righteousness that the Lord your God has given you this good land to inherit it. No, 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 not because of your righteousness. For you are a stiff-necked people. And so it's because of the righteousness of your forefathers. Indicating that righteousness is not a condition for you to continue to inherit the Holy Land. And so the land is yours unconditionally. The land is yours whether you are righteous or you're wicked. The land is yours whether you follow the religion of Abraham or you don't. It is still your land. That was an evil seed. And it grew into an evil tree called the Zionist movement. And the Zionist movement is exploiting it to the hilt. And the Jew who can see can do nothing about it. And of course, there are some Jews who can see, you know. Not all of them are one-eyed. <laughs> But there's nothing they can do about it. Nothing they can do about it. It's too late now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eventually allowed them to enter into the Holy Land after 40 years. And Dawood alayhi salam establishes the state of Israel. The first Islamic state. And establishes Jerusalem as the capital of the first Islamic state. And he is succeeded by his son Suleiman, Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam. And he builds the masjid in the capital city of the Islamic State. And when you read the story in the Quran of Suleiman alayhi salam and the Queen of Sheba, read between the lines and you'll see in that story the recognition of the State of Israel as the ruling state in the world. And the definition of a ruling state is that it can impose its will on any rival. And so this is the golden age, the golden age of Banu Israel, the time of Nabi Dawood alayhi salam and Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam. But after the death of Suleiman alayhi salam, then there was rivalry. We don't have the time, I'm afraid, to go into those details. But I mentioned to you last December when I was here a very interesting book that you might want to read. It's entitled, Who Wrote the Bible? Who Wrote the Bible? It was written by an American scholar of the Bible who is recognized for his scholarship, a professor of Harvard. His name is Richard Friedman. And the book is sold for about $11, $12. In that book, Richard Friedman exposes for you all the fraud in the Bible, in the Torah, the rewriting of the Torah so many times. He's able to identify this writer, he wrote this passage and that passage and that passage and that passage. And this second writer, he wrote this passage and this passage and that passage. By comparing the writing, the style of the writing. He also explains why this rewriting of the Torah takes place. Because of rivalry between the descendants of Harun alayhi salam and the descendants of Musa alayhi salam. One of the things which were rewritten, of course, concerns the... You don't mind my mentioning it? Huh? The prohibition of riba. You still don't mention? Don't mind? 
<laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had prohibited riba in the Torah. They changed the Torah. They rewrote it. The Torah now says, you can find it, go look in it, you'll find it, it's still there. It is haram for a Jew to lend money on interest to another Jew. Rabbi, can you tell me why? Answer, don't rip off your own brother. <laughs> That's why. It is haram for a Jew to lend money on interest to another Jew. But it is halal, he can lend money on interest to those who are not Jews. It's called double standards. It's called double standards. And it stinks. When I speak on the subject Islam and the international monetary system, which will be at Lakemba, I think, Wednesday, Blacktown, I hope it's not too far away. Good. When I speak, this is a very, very important subject, eh? and you'll be hearing it in Australia for the first time. Islam and the international monetary system. Then you're going to hear some more on this subject. Because of this change they've made in the Torah concerning riba, among other things, they have now violated the condition of righteous conduct. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to this. In Surah to Bani Israel, he refers to this as fasad. Fasad is corruption. This is the corruption of the word of Allah. لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ وَقَدَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ فِي الْكِتَابِ فِي الْكِتَابِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ وَلَتَعَلُنَّ عُلُوًا كَبِيرًا That we recorded it in the Torah, in the Zabur, in the Torah, that Banu Israel will commit fasad in the land, yani Al-Ardul Muqaddasa, in the Holy Land, on two occasions. This is the first one. When the word of Allah is rewritten, corrupted, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to it by sending an army from Babylon. An army that worshipped the sun and the moon and the stars and idols. Ibadan lana, he says. And some Arabs have been saying to me, no Imran, Allah will not refer to a people who are disbelievers as ibad. To which we respond with Surah Yaseen, Ya hasratan ala al-ibad. Ya hasratan ala al-ibad. Ma yaatihim min ayatin ila akhir al-aya. So these ibad are sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they destroy the state of Israel. And they destroy the masjid. And they take Banu Israel into slavery in Babylon. And so now they're, they're weeping by the rivers of Babylon. While they're out there in Babylon, however, a very important communication from Allah, which explains history, which explains politics, which explains the economy. And you, you're talking to someone who studied international relations eh? at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva, so I know something about the subject. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a prophet, Isaiah. He sends many other prophets, but this one in particular, to communicate a divine promise. What is the promise? That Allah was going to send a prophet to Banu Israel. Who would be their prophet? And who would be known as Al-Masih, the Messiah? And who, when he comes, will rule the world from the throne of Dawood alayhi salam with a rule which will be eternal. 
The throne of Dawood alayhi salam is the state of Israel. It is Jerusalem. And so when the Messiah comes, he will rule the world from Jerusalem. Which is why Mr. Bush is so anxious to attack Iraq. Yes. You don't understand, eh? The Jews realized that if the Messiah is to rule the world from Jerusalem when he comes and Jerusalem is under Babylonian occupation then there are certain very simple logical deductions number one the Messiah will have to liberate the Holy Land which is now under Babylonian occupation number two the Messiah will have to bring Banu Israel back to the Holy Land, not as tourists, but to reclaim it. Number three, the Messiah will have to restore the state of Israel in the Holy Land. And number four, that state of Israel, of Israel, will have to become once again the ruling state in the world. And then the Messiah can rule the world from Jerusalem, from this, the, the throne of Dawood, alayhi salam. In other words, when the Messiah come, he will have to bring back the golden age. When the Jews rule the world. Shall I repeat that? When the Messiah comes, he will have to bring back the golden age when the Jews rule the world. And so in the heart of every Jew, there is this absolute conviction that one day we will rule the world once again. And when we do that, we will rule forever. But when Allah sent the Messiah, I'm going to have to cut some corners now eh, because of time. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Messiah, some of them accepted him. The young ones, the poor, the humble, the innocent. But the rabbis, the administration, the establishment, they rejected him. Why did they reject him? They say he's a bastard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had tested them. And because they were seeing with only one eye, they failed the test. If they had been seeing with two eyes, you know, Dajjal sees with one. And all those who followed Dajjal see with one. Even when they're issuing all their fatwas and so on, they still see with one. But if you see with two eyes, which are the two? The external and the internal then they would have said wait a minute nobody knew that she was pregnant huh? nobody knew she was pregnant and from the time she was aged two until the age of puberty she lived in the temple and she had the chief rabbi himself as her guardian Zachariah alayhi salam and our chief rabbi himself told us of the miracle. The mihrab in those days was not a niche in the wall. The mihrab was an inner room called the Holy of the Holies. And in that inner room, only the sacred relics were kept. Hmm? And only the chief rabbi could enter that room, nobody else. Because she was under his guardianship, she was allowed into enter into the mihrab. Nobody else. When the old man went in into the mihrab one day, he saw her with food. He said, Maryam, anna laki hadha. Maryam, where did you get this food? She said, I asked and he sent it. So the old man must have taken off his hat and scratched his head. She asked, and he sent it, and I want a son. I better ask too. 
Huh? And then, of course, you know the story. He went in into the mihrab now by himself, all alone, nobody with him, and he asked. And the angel came and said, Allah has accept, accepted your salah, your dua. And you're going to have a son, and Allah even gave him a name already. What's his name? Yeah, yeah. Hmm? So the, the whole world knew, knew this story. Everybody in the land knew it. This was the most famous girl in the whole land. This was the most learned girl in the whole land. This was the most virtuous girl in the whole land. This Jewish girl. And no one knew she was pregnant. She had left the town before her pregnancy could be observed. When the baby was born, if she had committed that vile deed, then what she should have done was to try to conceal her sin. Maybe take the baby, put it in front of somebody's front door, knock on the door, and run away. Huh? In New York, of course, they do something else, throw it in the garbage bin. <laughs> but she didn't do that. She didn't do it. She came back with the baby. She came back with the baby in front of her, not behind her. She came through the front road, not through the back road. She came in the daylight, not in the night time. She knew who the baby was because the angel told her, this is the Messiah. And she knew that this is a test, so she has to be silent. So when they questioned her, Mary, how could you do this thing? Your father and mother were not like this. She only pointed to the baby. Mary, babies don't talk. But this time the baby talked. And when the baby declared that I am the messenger of Allah, they responded and they said, Hada sikhrum mubin. A plain magic. So they said, he could not be the Messiah. Why? Because he's a bastard. وَنَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ هَذَا And then when he lambasted them for their riba. And I was in South Africa for the last three months. And when I started talking on riba, I saw people started moving away from me. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, this subject is a wonderful subject. <laughs> riba. <laughs> when he started lambasting them for their riba, he went into the temple, the masjid, and he found them engaged in riba, not the lending and borrowing of interest, on interest, the other form of riba that I'll be speaking about in my subject on Islam and the international monetary system. He cursed them, and he turned over their tables, and he chased them out of the masjid. And he declared that you've taken the house of Allah and transformed it into a den of thieves. And then decided he must die. And then they forced the hand of the Roman government to execute him. But how? By hanging. Crucifixion. Why did they want him to die like that? Because it's still there in the Torah. It is still there up to now. They've not taken it out. They're not going to take it out. Whoever dies by hanging is the cursed of Allah. So if we can get him to die like that, it will now become absolutely plain and clear beyond the shadow of a doubt. He could not have been the Messiah. And then when they saw him die, they were so overjoyed they could dance with joy. him, Allah says, they're boasting now. Inna. This is called sarcasm. We've killed him. The Messiah, meaning sarcasm. The son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. They didn't believe all of that. They thought he was an imposter. When they saw him die on the cross before their very eyes, it was now absolutely plain and clear, beyond a shadow of a doubt, he could not have been the Messiah. Why? 
He has the curse of the Lord upon him. Why? He's dead, but he never ruled the world from Jerusalem with a rule which is eternal. Huh? What they didn't know and what no one knew, absolutely no one knew, not even the Pope. <laughs> Until Allah revealed the Quran, no one knew it. Was no, they did not kill him. That was their first objective, to kill him. So Allah says, you did not achieve objective number one. Objective number two was to cause him to die on the cross, not on the ordinary death. So Allah says, no, you did not achieve objective number two as well, because he was not crucified. Hmm? Well, I can shubbihalahum. Allah made it appear unto you that that was what happened. Hmm? But Rafahu Allahu ilay Allah raised him unto Himself. One day he's coming back, and guess what he's going to do when he comes back? He's going to rule the world. He's going to rule the world from Jerusalem with a rule which will be eternal and so that will be the end of history tell that to Francis Fukuyama for me tell that to Francis Fukuyama and Samuel Huntington for me this is the truth not what they have when he comes back and rules the world with eternal rule from Jerusalem it is Islam which will be established in the Holy Land. And so Islam will rule the world. And no government, including the government of Australia, can stop that. Let them take that and chew it. By my estimate, and you're going to have to read my book to understand how I arrive at this conclusion, I use two methods. My understanding is that that day is about 50 years away from now. And I can be wrong, of course. I can be wrong. But it's interesting for you to examine the method I've used. Two different routes to arrive at this conclusion that that day is just around the corner. I may not live to see it. My son may not live to see it, but my grandson may see it. After they had boasted of how they crucified him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded and listened to the ayah. Listen to it. Because in this ayah is located the historical process. He says, Wa im min ahlil kitab illa la yu'minanna bihi qabla mawti. وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ شَهِيدًا If you are an Arab and you can understand directly the ayah of the Quran, the taste in your mouth is sweeter. But if you have to depend upon a translation, it ain't the same thing anymore. <laughs> Which is why you must learn sufficient Arabic to be able to understand oh it's like music in the eyes of in the ears of the Palestinians now Allah is warning he says not a single one of you will escape every single Jew on that day when the son of Mary comes back and before he experiences mouth like everyone else in Kulu Nafsin Za'ikatul Maut every soul must taste death including the son of Mary so before that event takes place when he returns every single Jew will now have to accept him as the Messiah I went in a synagogue in New York and I told them that <laughs> When the lecture was over, the Jews surrounded me. <laughs> I was in the center and they were all around me. 
And they were furious. They were demanding why, why, why should we be forced to do something we don't want to do? So I said, on that day you'll be able to see that which you're not seeing now. You will have, of course, they never invited me back to their synagogue. <laughs> and every Christian on that day, including the Pope, will have to accept that he is Nabi. Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Exactly as Muhammad alayhi salam said. And that he ain't no son of God. And there ain't no trinity. And so that is the end of Christianity. The cross is broken. And the swine are killed. And only one true religion now remains. But when they accept him now as Nabi and as Al-Masih, it will be of no benefit to them. Because this is the last moment now when this, the, the eyes are unveiled and you can now see when death is staring you in your face. Because at that moment, when the son of Mary comes back, and they can now see, now it's too late. Because now the Muslim army will come and liberate the Holy Land. And no one can stop that army. He said, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, he said, when you see the black flags coming from the direction of Khorasan, go and join our army, even if you have to crawl over ice. So I told them in Lodium, in South Africa, go and join our army even if you have to leave your BMWs behind. <laughs> because no one will be able to stop that army until it reaches Jerusalem. Hmm? They now die. The worst possible death, knowing that all that they had held on to as truth was falsehood, and all that they had opposed and demonized and rejected as falsehood was the truth. So they die the most horrible of all deaths. And when they are raised for judgment, he gives evidence against them and they go into the hellfire. Who died like that? Who died like that? Yes, when he was drowning underneath the water, when he was drowning, and death was staring him in his eyes, then the veils were removed the eyes, and he said, now I believe in the God of Banu Israel. To which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded, and we never knew about this, no. For thousands of years, we never knew about this. No university in the world knew about it. Until the Quran was revealed. Al-An, now Fir'aun, Surah Yusuf. No, yes, Surah Yunus. Al-An, now Fir'aun. Waqad asayta qabl. And before this, you were in such obstinate rejection. وَكُنْتَ مِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ فَالْيَوْمَ نُنَجِّيكَ بِبَدَنِكَ This day, we have determined to preserve your physical body. لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً So that your body, when it is recovered in history, will function as a sign of all signs, as big as a billboard. For a people who will suffer the same fate that you suffered. That the countdown has now begun for them. لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِنَ النَّاسِ عَنْ آيَاتِنَا لَغَافِلُونَ How pathetic is this language. How sad is this language. He says most people, they don't have time for my ayat. They're too busy. You got to go to work and come back home and earn money to buy the BMW. So they don't have time for my ayat. How pathetic is this language? How sad 
in this language. They are oblivious of the ayat of Allah, which unfold in the historical process and are as big as billboards facing them. When was the body of Pharaoh recovered? At the end of the 19th century. And that was when the countdown began. That you are now going to face the same fate that he suffered. You will die the way he died.